My name's Yusuf. I'm 52 years of age. I've been a Muslim for 27 years. I'm uh, ethnically, I'm, I'm from uh, an Irish stock uh, with a bit of English in there as well. Father was Catholic, my mother was Catholic, um, although only nominally Catholic. They didn't really take it that seriously. Uh, we didn't have an, any religious uh, upbringing at all, uh, no education in terms of religion, and we lived our lives as we saw fit, as, we, as our desires took us, we went. My mother and father used to give me some indications of what is right and what is wrong, but very, very little in the way of religious instruction, so we were free. Uh, basically, I left school at the age of 15. I ran away from home at the age of 15. Uh, my, my father had already left uh, home when I was four, and the last thing I said to my father was, uh, Dad, you better leave because my mum doesn't like you anymore. You know, so I, that was the last time I saw him uh, as, as a young, as a child, uh, until I was 24. I went to s seek him out after that. Uh, that was part of the journey for me to find myself because uh, once I'd left home, I started traveling a lot. I started broadening, broadening my horizons, meeting people. I'd always ask lots of very difficult questions and um, usually people would uh, you know, come back to me and saying, why do you ask so many questions? You're so annoying. <laughs> Get out of here. You know? um, but I kept asking questions because my idea was that <laughs> I'm on this amazing journey uh, with thousands and thousands of people around me, millions of people around me, and I should be asking them, like they should be asking me, what's it all about? Where's this journey taking us? You know, has someone got a road map? <laughs> you know, where's the sat nav? <laughs> you know, so yeah, I mean, I spent years and years and years asking and traveling and asking again. And I naturally, when I read books on philosophy or religions or the purpose of life, uh, so I, I started to seek out those people that were writing those books. So I met the Christians, I met the Jews, I met the Buddhists, I met the Hindus, I met, I met everyone apart from Muslims, by the way, because uh, I didn't even know what Muslim was or Islam was at all at that time. I asked the Christian uh, at least once or twice and they said they didn't know what, who God was. I met uh, the, some Hindu uh, worshippers and they uh, weren't able to answer the simple questions about what the purpose of life was in a very, very simple, easy, understandable, digestible way. So I left them, uh, I met the Buddhists and I started doing Buddhist meditation for at least three months I was doing. And it made me feel good, you know, so I, I, I didn't leave off the Buddhist meditation, but I asked the question, I popped the question one day and I said uh, to one of the guys uh, who happened to be one of the, he happened to be white uh, 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 Buddhists as well. I asked him, what's the purpose of life? So he was stirring his herbal tea at the time and he got round 15 rounds of stirring and, and, then pop, and they tried to ask, answer the question. He said, to contemplate the supreme nothingness. So I said, I'm confused. <laughs> Confused.com. <laughs> And he, he's tried to justify why he had evidently mentioned a contradiction in terms. By any stretch of the imagination, it's difficult to imagine something that's supreme and yet absolutely nothing. So he tried to give me the Golden Sutras and I started reading that and I couldn't understand it. I didn't think I was a, a shallow individual who couldn't understand things because I'd been reading a lot been reading Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, Russian authors and very complex materials in order to try and find the purpose of life, not to try and be big and intelligent, you know. And so this book I couldn't understand. So I said it can't be the truth because the truth has to be easily understood by most of the people, if not all the people. 
So I left that. <laughs> Uh, but I continued doing my Buddhist, Buddhist meditation. So I started looking into the Chinese uh, philosophy, started doing martial arts, I started doing Tai Chi. I did Tai Chi for three years. And I was still reading and reading and every ism and every schism and every possible thing which, which would help me to try and find me, Tim, who am I, <laughs> you know? Um, and it was a big struggle. Massive struggle. So I went off and uh, I was told that, you know, the top 5% of the world, they go to university. <laughs> I got to Sussex University, uh, studying politics and third world development, because that seemed really interesting to me. But it wasn't the paper, it wasn't the, it wasn't the subject, it was the fact I was going there with this top 5% of the world sitting with me. So I got there and I was mortally disappointed because most of them were just out to get drunk and uh, have a hedonistic lifestyle whilst they were away from their family for the first time in their lives. Uh, you know. So I, I was there in the university and um, I was pushing, prodding, poking everyone again and again and again, trying to find out what this life is, you know. And 99% of the people just don't want to talk about it. This is what I found. You've got to find the 1%. And when you find the 1%, you don't want to leave them, you know. One day, I had a particular uh, female friend that was uh, told me not to, to b b bother calling her the day after, you know. So I went to the Islamic Society because I was so confused and I, was, I had a real bust up with her and a fallout with her and an argument and um, I wanted to know why she kicked me out. Because she said uh, as she was kicking me out, it's something to, to do with my religion. And I happened to know she was a Muslim. So after all of these millions of questions and unanswered questions at that, you know, what led me to this faith was an argument about a religion which she claimed to be following. So anyway, knocked on the door of the Islamic Society and I found this Iraqi guy with his headscarf and uh, a smile as well, a kind of a nice smile. And I said, look, I've got a problem with my girlfriend. <laughs> So I, he said, you got a problem with your girlfriend? I said, why? He said, well, she's Muslim and she just told me that she didn't want to, you know, me to come today. So I want to know why. So he's kind of said, well, look, um, best thing I can do is give you these. <laughs> give me a pile of books. And he said, read all these. So I did for two weeks. I just read and read and read and read. I read about how to make, uh, how to purify yourself as a Muslim, how to have a bath as a Muslim, <laughs> how to pray as a Muslim, what's the, the history of Islam. I started reading some of the chapters, or small chapters of the, the, the book, which they claimed was, uh, uh, you know, uh, sent from God. And slowly but surely, the answers started popping up. <laughs> Just miraculously from this incident. <laughs> then I discovered, of course, that the month was Ramadan. So then I started to learn that these guys were fasting, you know, for 30 days. Not continuously, of course, but... Uh, they were fasting the daylight hours of, of this month. And this month was about the, the coming of this book, which, we were taught, which I'd been reading, the Qur'an. And it was a, you know, it was a revelation to me at the time as well, because of course I never knew Islam, Muslims. That was the first time I heard about Islam, but I never, ever knew what, that Islam was a way that, that white, you know, Catholic people, 
uh, like me growing up in Britain could, could possibly accept. I thought it was a religion for brown people and <laughs> ethnics, you know. So um, I slowly but surely started getting the answers to the questions that I uh, had been, that had um, been dominant in my life, you know, for the, that 10 years. And I couldn't sleep. Days and nights would go by where I couldn't sleep. There were uh, moments when, you know, I, I just think, what's the point of this life without knowing, you know, without having any certainty about a direction, about a purpose? What's the point? I mean, would anyone go on a journey without knowing the destination, the purpose? Absolutely not. You know, it's, this is plaguing me every, every, every day. I, I, would, I would be looking at the, the stars and I would be literally crying every night, crying myself to sleep because, you know, you're tiny and this is huge and this, is a, this has a game plan. This has, this is more than just a, you know, a mere coincidence, a mere happening, that uh, something that's just happened out of nothing. This is, this is by design. And you have to find the purpose. So you come across this book which answers the, all of the questions. You don't like what you read. Some of it you don't like. But it's kind of good for you, right? <laughs> you, you realize it's good for you. And uh, it was probably the third week of Ramadan then. I, uh, I was reading that and I was watching these guys that were fasting and they were praying in that place five times a day in, in that center. And I would join them and I would be doing the prayers with them, but I couldn't really know what was going on, but it felt right. And one day I woke up and I said, look, I'm going to fast today because the fasting is the thing that really seemed to be very attractive and it was a challenge for me and it, I thought it might help me in the journey. So I prayed, uh, I, I, I started fasting that day and it was like somebody had removed the blindfold, uh, they'd unlocked the door, um, They'd remove the earmuffs, and I was able to think clearly. And just that moment, on that day, on that time, was the, the moment when I found Islam. Because, you know, when you're fasting sincerely to find the one that created everyone here and everyone out there and everyone that's going to be created later on, after we go and we leave this planet and leave this journey, is the ultimate sacrifice when you give off your food and give away your, the luxuries that you have and the water. And you do it sincerely, seeking the face of the, the one that created you, is the moment when you truly, you found yourself, you know. So that was that day, that was the day. And I hadn't taken what was called the Shahada or the Declaration of Faith because I thought, well, God knows me better. So why would I bother, you know? Anyway, I went on right until the end of Ramadan. And uh, one night I was just super aware of myself of being like needing to get rid of the past and start something new. It just, just felt like that. So the whole night I was just like, I was making this ritual ablution, you know, watching, because I was reading it all the time in the books I had with me and trying to get rid of something that was in the past. And then in the morning, very early in the morning, I just walked. I went up and I started looking for a mosque. 
I went into a mosque. I got to the top of the stairs and the guy grabbed hold of me and said, look, what's, what's going on? What are you here for? Can we help you? I said, yeah, I've just come to embrace Islam. He said, well, we don't know you. I mean, we've never seen you. What do you know about Islam? He said, I've been reading about Islam for the last two, three weeks, in fact, and I've been fasting as well. So they were quite surprised. And they said, well, have you, have you washed? I said, I've been washing the whole night, man. <laughs> I made the declaration of faith. And then I kind of got hugged by 300 men, you know, and I'd never been hugged by a guy before. <laughs> Not even my father, I don't think. <laughs> I remember feeling that it really was a very amazing moment. And it was, it was unlikely that I would feel that way again. That feeling of elation, the feeling of... Actually, I was, I'd felt very relieved because imagine spending 10 years searching and searching for something which you don't even, you don't even know what that is. It's not like you go on, you search, some, search for something, right, which you know, and you pretty much know where you drop that thing. So you've got a, a very small area that you can check you know, from home to work, back to school. Yeah, I, I can trace, retrace the journey. But with something like the purpose of human existence in a sea of eight billion people with millions and millions of potential miles you need to travel, and that took me 10 years. I was 20, 25 or 26 by the time I embraced Islam, and I... I, I <sighs> So the feeling was amazing. It was something which is groundbreaking. And then, of course, ever since, uh, you know, we've got all the challenges of being a person who does claim to believe in God. So I didn't really have any concerns uh, about, you know, taking that plunge and becoming a, a Muslim because I was doing it sincerely to try. And, and, and if I didn't do it, what was I going to do in, instead? I would, I, I would, you know, I was destined to fail, to literally become an alcoholic or, or, or to, um, to be a person that would just live their life as a hermit. Literally, that's the way I was thinking at the time before I embraced Islam. So I didn't really have any um, hang-ups about accepting something that was going to really, truly speaking, help me here. It doesn't matter, the external didn't matter to me. At that point, I would do anything to find the truth. And, there, and there's a lot of people out there like that in this world. I've met lots of them. And they, 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 they genuinely good people. You know, they have that feeling in their heart. They really want to, they really want to spit it out. But really, there's nothing to be fearful of. Rather, that you should be fearful of the fact that you're not being sincere to yourself, true to yourself. That creates mental conditions. There's a lot of people that have psychosis and mental issues because they're not true to themselves. What their heart and their soul is telling them, they're not doing that. And this is, you know, we call it hypocrisy. <laughs> We mustn't be hypocrites. A community of Muslims practicing the faith of Islam uh, is a family that most people don't have. And I gained that family. It's 1.6 or 1.7 billion people worldwide. I go and visit them. I can just say, uh, peace be unto you uh, in a gathering of people in a room. And I've got potentially a thousand invites <laughs> right in front of my face, you know, if I go and pray in a mosque in wherever it is, Abu Dhabi or Kuwait or America or France. Or... So that's the community that I never had. And I yearned that community. I remember when I married my wife, I said, I need to marry into a family. I need a family because we increasingly in the world, not just in the Western Hemisphere, we don't have, we're lonely. 
you know, 40% or more of the population of London lives on their own. That's shocking. People don't even know their neighbors. This is just London. London, number one capital of the world, right, that everybody loves to be part of. But people are not part of each other, you know. They're distant from each other. So I, I believe that the greatest thing that the faith of Islam gave me, apart from the massive direction and being able to have secure in the fact that um, there is a purpose, um, I don't need to go out to the pub and get drunk anymore. Uh, if I want to get drunk, I just pray. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I want to find direction, I, I've got the satnav. I've got the, I've got the map. If I want to know anything about the faith, I, I rest assured I can go to someone who knows about the faith and they will give me direction as well. And I have that massive, beautiful, uh, unending family. Uh, and if you find the right members of that family, then you feel great. Let's just be brutally frank. We need to know who we are, where we're we going, who created us. We ask ourselves these questions on a daily basis. Even if we don't vocalize it, we certainly think it. 